at an international conference organized by us on a very interesting subject, India in Travel Writings, 1500 to 2000, Producing Knowledge, Fashioning Cells, and Others. We have uh, a marvelous list of speakers for this conference, some of whom speak about European travelers and some about travelers from other parts of the world during the period. And the topics that are covered are also very, very diverse. We have, uh, for example, one theme, Early Modern Perceptions of India, Indian Travelers to the West, which is a relatively unexplored area, and uh, Pilgrimage and East Asian Travel Narratives. And very interestingly, 19th century botanical knowledge and British travel writing. Bengali regional and international travelers, travelers to Malabar, Bengal, and North India in travel writings, and so on. So I'm delighted that we have been able to organize this international conference, and I particularly thank uh, uh, Professor Rita Banerjee, who is a fellow with Nehru Memorial Museum and Library for her untiring efforts for organizing this conference. I also thank my colleagues of the Center for Contemporary Studies, particularly Iqbal and Rajneesh, without whose efforts no conference here or no lecture here can be organized. So I'm really delighted that we have been able to organize this conference, and I welcome all the participants, all the speakers, and all other members of the audience. In particular, I welcome Professor Shuan Pao Rubies, who is going to give the keynote uh, address later. Uh, the subject of uh, this conference is, of course, very, very important. Uh, let me uh, say a few words uh, about uh, the subject before I uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Rubis for his uh, keynote address. Uh, India in Travel Writings, 1500 to 2000, Producing Knowledge, Fashioning Selves and Others, is a very important uh, topic. What we notice about it in the first glance itself is the periodization that has been taken. 1500 is the cutoff here. What is the significance of 1500? In my opinion, till about uh, the 15th, 16th century, the most important, the greatest uh, travelers around the world for many centuries had been the Arabs. You see, they had traveled to various parts of Africa, Europe, and of course, Eurasia, China, India, and they have left very detailed accounts at times and very perceptive accounts of different societies that they had visited. And it is from, the, from uh, roughly the 15th century that we start uh, getting uh, more uh, European travelers, and then in the next 200 years or so, gradually the European travelers become the most important both in terms of numbers and the importance of the historical narratives that they create. And much of the historiography of the modern world in the colonized societies especially is uh, based on the foreign travelers' accounts. So uh, this is a very important point to my mind. Now what is it that uh, enabled these travelers, for example, in the 15th century itself there were important foreign travelers from uh, from Europe, for example, we had uh, uh, Niccolo Conti and we had uh, Athensius Nicotin. These people uh, came via land routes uh, largely to India. And these land routes, I uh, argue, had been uh, opened in a way because of the creation of the Mongol world empire in the 13th and 14th centuries. Unlike what is said that there was a Silk Road in the ancient period which connected uh, China with Europe, my contention is that there was no such land route which was there before the origin of the Mongol world empire because they integrated the political systems and they, they were also able to provide peace over the vast Eurasian landmass which for the first time made it possible for people uh, to travel uh, with, a, with, with a not so high degree of risk. And this obviously opened up uh, routes for some European travelers also to come to India, especially to the Vijayanagar Empire initially. 
So this is again a very important point that uh, we must understand that the agency here that uh, allowed the European travelers initially to travel and of course if we take uh, Marco Polo's uh, travel account to be genuine then Marco Polo was the first traveler who was able to make that journey from the Mediterranean world to China and Marco Polo it is not surprising at all that a Marco Polo did not exist before the Mongol times because the Mongols had created the world empire which is spread from the Mediterranean to the uh, eastern parts of China and therefore uh, the travel of uh, Marco Polo is, was certainly possible at that time. Um, now the travelers, the European travelers I can speak uh, largely about them only. They can be divided in, uh, uh, in a few uh, uh, categories. One, of course, the 15th century, uh, we had uh, Conti and Nigaten. Then in the 16th century, we had three important uh, travelers who uh, stayed in the Vijayanagar courts of various kings, Barbosa, Pius and Nunes, and they have left marvelous accounts of uh, the city of Vijayanagar, and the defense, the economy, society, etc. of the Vijayanagar Empire. These are very, very valuable accounts which corroborate uh, the information provide, provided by the other sources. And in fact, in many cases, they are the only uh, sources of information on the historiography of southern India and of Vijayanagar Empire. And then, of course, 17th century is very, very rich in terms of foreign travelers. And now the foreign travelers are more uh, French and uh, there is a shift of... Uh, the, the region of Europe that they come from. So you have, uh, they, you have Dutch also, Pelsert, and then Italian Mundi, Tavernier, Bernier, Manucci, who spent all his life in India in the 17th century. And they have, by and large, provided valuable information on the Mughal Empire. And in the case of the Mughals, it is all the more important because the, uh, the archival sources about the Mughals and many other sources are also very, very rich. So the travelers' accounts provide an additional source of information to us. In some cases, they corroborate the evidence provided by other sources. And in some cases, of course, they diverge. So it is left to the individual historian to figure out how to use these sources. And even in the 18th century, of course, there were a very large number of uh, important travelers, especially from Europe, who have left their accounts. And these are uh, valuable sources of historiography for us. Uh, uh, one very important uh, uh, traveler who lived uh, in India for many years was Comte de Mudab, whose account, Voyage on End du Comte de Mudab, has never been translated. And it has been used as a source of historiography, to the best of my knowledge, by very few historians. So, uh, in fact, at Nehru Memorial now, we have uh, somebody who is uh, doing some work on this. So, uh, this is a very, very uh, broad overview of... Uh, the travelers we had, uh, you know, in India. Uh, one last point I would like to make is that, um, as I said at the beginning, in the historiography of India, the travelers' accounts have been very, very important. And in this, one can say that compared to any other important nation or country of the world, Indian historiography has depended more on the travelers' accounts, especially in the last 500 years, Partly because of, uh, at times, uh, deficit in other kinds of sources, but partly also because Indian historiography from the beginning, it was it uh, kind of, uh, uh, because it was a colonial historiography as it is started, so there was uh, an overemphasis on the travelers' accounts. They were taken to be more unbiased, and of course they were readily available. They were available in languages that could be read by historians. So, yes, in that sense, they became uh, more important. However, the fact of the matter is that Indian historiography, as it has developed over the last 500 years, has moved on. And various other kinds of sources have been used for uh, writing history, which is how it should be. As uh, our keynote speaker is going to uh, speak on this subject, European perceptions of India and the problem of cultural distance, this is one thing that I have, is very close to my heart, but since he is an expert on the subject, I would not like to venture uh, uh, on it. But just a few things I would like to say. I don't remember the name of this traveler. He, I think he was an ambassador, Ottoman ambassador to Europe. Bernard Lewis has mentioned uh, this in one of his books. And he was in Vienna at that time. He was on the road and he saw the emperor 
passing through the street and there was a lady there so the emperor uh, took off his hat you know in respect uh, to the lady and now this person uh, ottoman muslim he writes that uh, the the infidels are very uh, uh, courteous to the women probably because of mary mother mary so he is a kind of giving a totally different understanding what the europeans would have regarded as a gesture of chivalry is being uh, linked by him with uh, uh, with christianity as such so this is how cultural distance can have very very uh, uh, sort of important consequences for travelers accounts in the case of our own country we find uh, so many examples of this kind when european travelers uh, write about uh, 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 the indian living conditions for example uh, the the dresses of indians the food they eat their housing etc uh, quite often there are distortions because there is a lack of understanding about uh, the culture and the society of this country and most of the time it is not at all deliberate it is just natural like even now in this uh, interconnected a global city when we go to a country for the first time a country that is very different from our own country a society that is very different from our own society we are often baffled so what would have been the state of mind of a traveler 300 years ago 500 years ago when he would visit india for the first time and see a society totally different from the society he was familiar with quite naturally it it he would be baffled and some of the observations that they would make uh, would not be factually so correct and uh, their interpretation of things would not be so correct however they are important because they give us how we were an image of how we were perceived by the others which is a part of uh, the subject of this conference producing knowledge fashioning selves and others the foreign travelers naturally valued things which were probably missing in their own societies so you see that they notice things that are important to them and they interpret them often in their own manner and this is true of uh, almost all foreign travelers it would be true of travelers which uh, have gone from india to other countries as much as it is true of the travelers who have come to india from other countries so i'm not criticizing the travelers accounts for this but certainly this is something that uh, needs to be kept in mind that it is through this uh, dynamic process that they uh, uh, they try to fashion the self and the other how we are different for example when you read these 17th century travelers about the mughal empire they generally emphasize the authoritarian character of the mughal empire and they say that you know if you speak against the emperor you would be trampled under the elephant i think bernier says that but uh, was this always the case yeah. if you were a commoner and you said something against the empire were you really trampled under the feet of the uh, elephant or was it that if you were a threat to the empire you were targeted and threat to the state uh, you know those kind of people are targeted by the state even now actually maybe not trampled under the feet of the elephant but in other ways they are targeted so uh, this also needs to be uh, kept in mind that uh, and one last point that i would like to make is that i don't know whether somebody is uh, making this comparison or not because the conference focuses on india in travel writings but there needs to be some effort towards making a comparative analysis of how travel writings have shaped the historiography of uh, other important countries and civilizations in this case uh, a very valuable comparison can be made with ottoman historiography and chinese historiography on the one hand and india on the other because a very large number of travelers in the european travelers especially they travel to different parts of the ottoman empire they have left their accounts and they traveled uh, to china they have also left valuable accounts and in fact the jesuits they became uh, sinophiles 300 years ago and they have uh, written so glowingly about uh, the chinese some of the things that they were missing uh, you know in their own countries they have admired greatly for example order which is still uh, admired uh, about uh, china so uh, with these uh, very few words and uh, i again uh, welcome everyone to this conference and without taking any more uh, time i now invite our uh, keynote speaker professor juan pao rubies to deliver his keynote address let me just turn this on first thank you
Well, um, first of all, I would like to thank very much uh, the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library uh, for the invitation to come to this conference and to open it with a, with a, with a, with a talk. Especially, would like to be to thank um, Rita Banerjee uh, for her um, individual invitation. Um, I have not had an opportunity to to be in India for many years now, so it's a real pleasure for me to be able to to be here talking about a topic that it has been part of my professional life um, since I began my PhD in Cambridge in the late 1980s, and which um, has accompanied me for many, many years. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's especially pleasurable to be here because it allows me also to reflect upon um, a topic that um, has, I have had been living with and have had to live with for many, many decades now. Um, but always, always with pleasure, because um, I think that the encounter between India and Europe is a source of um, reflection that is um, uh, which is stimulating to both uh, many kinds of Europeans and many kinds of Indian peoples. So, um, and I say many kinds because this is really what I want to talk about today. The opposition between India and Europe is the starting point of the conference and of the, the book I produced and of many people's research on this topic. And it does seem, does seem to make sense. There is a kind of European civilization, there is a kind of Indian culture and civilization that, that um, get in touch with each other um, 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 through trade, diplomacy, war, conquest, colonialism, but also the literary encounters and descriptions, and literary descriptions in particular. Um, and as you rightly said, there is um, a lot that, in, uh, that the Indian scholars have had to have learned from, from European travelers accounts just because often you don't have alternative sources, or at least they help put other sources in perspective. However, the, uh, the opposition between those who observe and those who are observed um, uh, has a tendency to create a simplistic dichotomy. Um, I mean, the, there is, anthropologists use the distinction between emic and etic um, as a way of describing internal and external perspectives of a cultural system. Those who are inside the system know the rules. Those outside don't. So for someone coming, let us say, to India from, let's say, Portugal in the 16th century, they are initially coming to um, a, a cultural system they need to learn the rules of. They don't know. Um, however, the problem with putting a lot of emphasis on this distinction is that um, it tends to to reify cultural systems as blocks, um, as if all Europeans had the same cultural assumptions, whatever their national origin or their professional calling or their personal life experience, and as if all the inhabitants of the vast subcontinent that is India belong to the same cultural background, when in fact you find massive amounts of differences, many Muslims, many Hindus, many uh, chains and other groups, um, including some Christians in South India, for example, but also um, the differences between men and women, the differences between um, uh, people who are there um, um, from one social group or caste and or another, people who have different languages, different ethnic backgrounds. In effect, we, we fall into the danger of not taking account of those different perspectives. So what I'm going to say is to, is to try to work with a definition of culture that avoids reification and includes internal diversity and complexity and also that captures the dynamics of change. I think that that is the, 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 the concept of culture we need when we deal with travel writing in order to avoid um, simplistic conclusions. So my, 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 my aim in, this, in today's paper is to interrogate this inside-outside dichotomy by looking at a number of examples of travelers to India uh, mostly Europeans, but not exclusively Europeans, from the late medieval to the early modern periods. And the, the, the ideas I, should, I would like to propose is that cultural, cultural distances do matter. They exist, obviously, um, uh, and they must be recognized and analyzed, but within a fluid system rather than assuming a dominant 
logic of cultural opposition, or uh, without falling into the idea of cultural incommensurability and incompatibility. Um, a careful analysis of um, Travers' perceptions helps explain how complex interactions actually drive cultural change and can reduce cultural distances. This is not to deny that culture always involves um, a differential element, which is education, and especially education into sociability. sociability. Uh, education is not just about the books you read, but it's also about how you socialize. And, and therefore, the, the, there always are inner circles and outer circles. So the, 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 the distinction between insiders and outsiders is always going to be there. But it's not necessarily one between Europe and India. It can be within India or within Europe. So let's begin with the travelers outsider. And my first example will be um, in Batuta, who um, allows me to go back to this medieval period that you also introduced as before Europeans uh, are the most important um, in number of travelers to India. Um, in Batuta, obviously, belongs to the Islamic Okumene of the Middle Ages. And um, uh, he's from Morocco. It's, Probably people are familiar with his Rila, which is a pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, which becomes not a pilgrimage to Mecca, but a pilgrimage to a, a journey to almost everywhere in the world where there are Muslims. Um, and he, he, uh, by Muslims, he, he means especially scholars and people who know the law. And interestingly, it's a trans he transforms the, the pilgrimage um, yeah, from going to Mecca, which he does, of course, into, into something much more extended. Um, now, what's interesting is that he spent many years in India, and he's, he's one of the men. I, I, I think, what, better one, I think, yeah. yeah better one. Can you hear me well? Okay. It's, it's, um, when he's in, in India, he was at the court of, um, of Delhi, of Muhammad in Tugluk. Then he was in South India as well. Um, um, especially, he spent some years in, the, in Kerala and the Maldive Islands. And um, in Batuta, in all these places, adopted the role of a judge, a caddy, someone who knows the Islamic law. And, uh, and he emphasized in his writing very much his context with men of learning and his position as someone who knew. In fact, in Batuta was not a particularly learned man compared with others in the Muslim world at the time. In fact, he was considered not particularly learn it by, by his contemporaries in Granada um, and the southern, in southern Spain, or still more than that time, um, uh, and, uh, or, or by others in places like Egypt or, 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 or uh, Iraq. In, in essence, um, it was in the peripheries of the Islamic world, in the, in, the, in, in the frontiers, where his skills were, and so it was more rare that he could acquire the job he did acquire. Uh, that's an interesting point, because what we see is that his narrative is very much about his own construction as a, of a self, of his own self, as a, as a traveler for those who are in, in, in the West and as an expert in the law for those who are in the East. And that has an impact in the way he's approaching many places. He's actually not learning any local languages. He speaks Arabic. That's the language he speaks in, in, in India. He doesn't really seem to meet many people who don't speak Arabic or talk to them. And you could say that he spends many years in India as an outsider. He, in essence, does not, does not um, uh, penetrate very deeply. His descriptions, for example, of the uh, customs of the, of the, of the Nayars of Kerala and other groups of, of South India are, have very interesting insights. I mean, he notices, as many other observers do, the matrilineal system of succession of the Nayar caste of Kerala, he compares it, interestingly, to the Berbers of Western Sahara, which he thinks have a similar system. And so it's an interesting ethnographic comparison. But his, his description is actually quite patchy. And superficially, we compare it with what uh, another traveler of Portuguese origin will be writing a few, um, uh, kind of, uh, in the early 16th century, a few decades later, uh, who, who was someone who lived in in, in Kananor and Calicut and Cochin for many, many years, who learned the local language, who became an interpreter, and who became an expert in many ways in dealing with 
their local communities. So what I'm saying here is that you can be in a place for many years and not necessarily make an effort to learn the language or penetrate the cultural system. I, I'm Batuta doesn't need to do that. His real audience is another one. I mean, I'm not, it's, not, it's not about blaming him or anything. It's just describing the fact that, that within that Islamic Khomeini, he is, he's in, for, for him the important people are the Turkic elites who are conquering India and, and the Sultan of Delhi and the merchant communities and the scholars who are Muslim. And, and that is, in essence, what, what, what his travel is about, what his journey is about. So what we, we find here is, is an element, I would say, of you can be an outsider in a world of cosmopolitanism, because Southern India in particular, Kerala, is a world of cosmopolitan interactions between especially mercantile communities of different places. He himself notes the presence of Chinese, the Chinese were in Kerala in the 15th century, in the 14th centuries as well. In fact, the Chinese also wrote about Kerala in the period, Mahuan, um, uh, who, was, um, who was one of the, the author of the most detailed description of the, of the, of the voyages of Zheng He and the, sent by the Ming emperors in the early 15th century, uh, wrote in his overall survey of the ocean sea um, uh, in the early uh, 15th century, uh, a description of all the parts visited by the Chinese fleets, um, which uh, had one of the key locations in Calicut. So if we take, take the point of view of Calicut, uh, rather than the point of view of Imbatuta, or, 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 uh, what we find here is a place where people from many different origins come to trade. Some, many are Arabs, others are Persian-speaking, Gujaratis are there as well, of course, uh, South Indians, and then we have as well the Chinese. Occasionally some Europeans, not many at the time. What we find then is cosmopolitanism without necessarily um, a, a deep level of cultural interaction uh, or with cultural interaction that can be quite selective in its approach. I mean, you could, you could have an interpreter who is helping you learn languages uh, that, that translate for the practical needs of doing business. Uh, what what Imbatuta does praise, he is very praise, uh, uh, is the safety of the roads and the justice, the justice that is implemented by the king of Calicut. Interestingly enough, the Chinese traveler, Ma Huan, observes the same. He is, of course, also in charge of a trading expedition. He is himself an interpreter. And um, he, he praises the fact that the, in South India, you can do business in a proper way like you would in China. The, the, the model, the, the value system in order to judge and assess um, and assess whether you have the right proper way of doing things is the Chinese Confucian system. He himself was a Muslim but he, he, was, he belonged to the world of, of, of Chinese cultural codes and norms wrote in Chinese and was a Chinese Muslim um, Mahuan, and, uh, and therefore uh, he has a, a sense of, of, of cultural norms that's very strongly biased towards uh, the Chinese way of doing things. So both the Chinese in Batuta, the Moroccan, and later on the Europeans like Duarte Barbosa <coughs> will all agree on some things. They will all agree on some exotic elements like the matrilineal system of succession, the fact that the Nayar women um, can have many sexual partners within their caste but are completely forbidden for other castes and how strictly this is is implemented. That is something everybody notices, slightly different variations. Everybody notices it's a good place to trade. There's a good system of justice where roads are safe. Basically, the kings of Malabar, the king of Calicut, the king of Cushin are in charge of making sure that business flourishes by keeping traders happy. That is the two points. But other than that, you, you, you could say quite clearly that Imbatuta remains very much in the let us now move, uh, just not yet, um, to, to, to Duarte Barbosa, this other traveler I mentioned, because I think he represents a different kind of position. Duarte Barbosa is part of the, of the uh, Portuguese colonial system. Uh, as you know, the Portuguese reach India in the early 16th century. They come in with an imperialistic approach. Mm, they're not um, 
we say there were two kinds of imperialisms in India, the one of the, of the Muslim elites conquering, um, conquering in, the, in, in, the, in northern India and the Deccan, and uh, uh, Afghans, Persians, Turkic tribes. And then you have the imperialism of Europeans coming by sea, creating commercial colonies, but not purely on the basis of trade, but also on the basis of the use of violence in order to improve trade. That is the Portuguese approach. They conquered Goa, as you know, and also Ormuz in the Persian Gulf, Malacca in, the, in Southeast Asia. And, um, and the Portuguese, in that sense, are clearly outsiders, they're imperialists, but they also operate in areas where they are in alliance with local rulers and they are not always in a position of complete dominance. And the, the, the important fact that I'm sure you're very familiar with of the Portuguese Empire is that it was in reality just a few outposts kept together by, by fleets um, and a few forts and, and guns to defend the forts but they didn't have the capacity to field huge armies. So their, their position was actually precarious and very limited to very few places. And a mind like Duarte Barbosa actually was, um, who was the author of the best, most detailed description of South India we have for the early decades of the 16th century, is a book that's been used again and again by, by historians of Kerala, and, but also the parts of India, he describes other parts, but especially Kerala in great detail, just because of what he called Malabar, just because of how extremely um, rich his observations are. Now, the fact that his observations are so rich, much more than those of Imbatuta, owe to the fact that he was essentially um, uh, a member of the factory, the, the commercial center in Kananor, which was not under Portuguese dominion. The Portuguese had a small little fort in Kananor, but there was a local king, uh, who was Hindu, and then there was a very important community of Muslim merchants who actually dominated very much the town. So in that position, he was actually not in a position of power like you would be in Goa. And, um, and his job was precisely to be the interpreter. He was the scrivener of the factory, and he was the man who knew Malayalam, the local language, something that, that um, Imbatuta never bothered to do, to learn the local language. So here we can say that he's putting himself in a position to acquire local knowledge to a much higher degree. And that is why his description of the customs of Malabar and the caste system of Malabar is so much more detailed, rich, and empirically, um, uh, and empirically uh, compelling. Um, it's much more systematic as well. He really was writing, and that's the other part of it, within a genre of practical ethnography. He was not writing in order to develop his own identity as a traveler or as a pilgrim, he was writing in order to perform service for the crown, which is to provide information, practical information. So what we he, he see here is, is a number of variables that are important. First, what, what is the investment of the individual in the writing? What is his own, to what extent is he in a process of identity, a building based on his own um, uh, personal agendas? Um, what is this, the genre he's writing? In, I mean, what, is, what are the conventions of the genre? In this case, he's writing some kind of practical geography. It's ethnography for information purposes, essentially, for, uh, for the governor of uh, Albuquerque and the kings of Portugal, the council in Portugal. Succeeding generations will read Barbosa. It will become, of course, also a very, very important book in Europe because it gets published. It was not published by the Portuguese. Interestingly, it was published by the Italians, an Italian travel collector, Giovanni Battista Ramosi in Venice, who essentially published something that the Portuguese had not meant to publish because for them that was the kind of government information you keep to yourself. So it is in that context that we find the most detailed, rich ethnography of the first encounter by a man who has become an expert, who probably married a local woman, is a casado, and this is another important fact about the Portuguese empire that we must emphasize now that the Portuguese come as settlers, they come without women, I mean with very few women, and therefore they marry local women, and therefore we can have very much a hybrid society, a society with cultural elements from, from two worlds. These are Catholic, Portuguese-speaking, but increasingly generation after generation, their mothers will be local women, and they will speak other languages as well at home, and they will eat different food, 
and Angoa will, and other parts, many Portuguese colonies will become areas where we would call Portuguese, but in reality are um, a, a combination of different cultural traditions. Um, um, <coughs> now, what, what I think that we can kind of very, before we move on to the next point, to, to, to emphasize at this point, is how there is two kind of forces going on here. One is the desire for accurate information within a conventional genre that varies from tradition to tradition. There's a Chinese ethnography, Mahuan. There is um, um, a, 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 an ethnographic tradition in the Arabic world, which finds expression in the Rila, but also in other kinds of geographical works, um, which very much emphasizes the marvelous and exotic. And then we have the Portuguese themselves producing um, now a new kind of ethnography, which is what we call colonial ethnography by a settler colonial society, but with practical aims. Um, of course, there are even more variations. We, this, is doesn't, this is not the only kind of text produced in Europe at the time. We could spend a whole hour just describing different kinds of travelers, different kinds of genres where travel writing is found. What the point here is simply to say that there is a variety of conventions in each tradition that shape the way practical information is included. And then there is an element of exoticism, which is often connected to ideological agendas, which is often also connected to identity building, and which varies, again, from case to case. In some, in some genres, this can be central. In other genres, this becomes marginal. But it never disappears entirely. Even the most practical-minded sources have an ideological agenda. Mahuan is very clear in his preface. He says, this is a book, this is based on my own observations, it's got a practical aim, but he also says, this is uh, a book that shows how the influence of the emperor in civilizing the world grows. So basically, the imperial tradition of China as a civilizing force is also made explicit. And the same could be said of many of the Portuguese with their own understanding of... Um, of, um, of the imperial mission, which is very much influenced by religion. In the case of, of Duarte Barbosa, interestingly, the point at which he is less accurate is when it comes to religion, which is the point at which he is a layman, he's a trader, uh, he's not a theologian, he doesn't get into detailed analysis, but he says that the trinity of the Hindus, what um, um, uh, um, uh, trinity of the Hindus is, uh, is like the Christian trinity, is a supreme god with three forms. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, here in the sense, is a parallel to the Christian trinity. Um, it, it is not the first, he's not the last person to say, to make that comparison. It's interesting that he's one of the first to do that. Now, what, therefore, we need to move on now is, in, in order to, to, to go deeper into this outsider, insider dichotomy, is to look at what kind of local engagements take place when the traveler in a, in, is, is, is in a place. And in the case of, of, of the Portuguese, I think it's quite interesting because, because we have them there, as I said, as casados, as people who get married and settle in this hybrid society. And what, what um, one example would be, for example, the case of caste. Caste is a concept, as you know, the word casta is Portuguese originally, or Spanish as well and it means lineage, it means pure lineage. When, when um, Duarte Barbosa is describing caste in South India and provides a very detailed classification of all the different groups, he is not working in a purely exotic position of saying this is completely alien to, the, to Europe. That's not at all the case. He is essentially saying that caste is similar to the system of Hidalguia, of aristocratic ancestry, that is so important also in Iberia. So the, point, the starting point for this analysis is not complete opposition, but analogy. There's some similarity there. However, caste is different in that it is much more extreme in the prohibitions that it enforces. And of course here we have an element that we can introduce, which is that within Christianity, the element of social distinctions is a hierarchical aristocratic society with social distinctions, but it is also a society with an idea of, of um, 
a spiritual quality. And so there's a tension between we all are part of the same church and, 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 and you are a noble man and you are a servant. Uh, um, what essentially, um, um, what essentially Barbosa is doing is to explore the concept of social, social distinction and then say, well, they go much farther in their prohibitions and in their emphasis on purity than we would go. That is the study. Now, the, the interesting thing is that Barbosa is himself, as I said, in what could, could be described as an area that's not of major political domination by the Portuguese, but as I said, Cananor is a city where you are forced to become very much involved with the local communities. In the case, and in his case professionally, in the case of Goa, on the other hand, we find the opposite. Goa becomes the capital of an attempt to be as Portuguese as possible in India. Therefore, there, they begin to destroy temples and they develop a very intolerant policy. And we find here an important group, um, which are the religious writers, the missionaries, whose job is to export Christianity to India in a Catholic version, and who often become the most detailed observers of, of, of Hinduism and Hindu customs because they are the ones who are in charge of evangelization and for that reason they need to learn more increasingly about, about, uh, about uh, Hinduism. Um, it, it's not in Goa itself the capital where we find people analyzing in detail Hindu traditions is usually more in the marginal areas. In, in Malabar, we have Giacome Fenicio, uh, for example, a libro de Seita de, uh, Seita de, de, de Zindas Orientais, a book about the sect of Oriental Indians in the early 17th century. We find people in, in like Roberto Novili in Madurai who, 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 who represents a very important effort to adapt to local customs, what we call accommodation, in order to make the Christian message more acceptable to the local Brahmins. So in, in essence, so as not to alienate different castes, you need to adapt to the caste system. That's his fundamental insight. And we have another example I would like to mention in some detail, which is Thomas Stephens, who was an English Catholic Jesuit in the island of Salcete. And his case is particularly interesting because he produced one word which I think can represent an example of Jesuit accommodation in its most, um, uh, in its most um, um, kind of like uh, sophisticated form. He writes, as, as you probably are familiar with, a Christian Purana which exists in two versions, in Marathi and in Portuguese. The Portuguese was published um, various times in Goa itself, uh, but the original work was written in Marathi, of course with the help of some, of some, of some, uh, some Christian Brahmin converts, and, and he is very clear that he writes in Konkani for the common people and in Marathi for the intellectual elites of South Sete, and uh, the, the, he considers the, the basic catechism something has to do in Konkani, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and he adopts Marathi as the language for the Christian Purana, which is a life of Jesus Christ written as a Purana. I don't know if you are familiar with that work. Um, this is a recent analysis by Anania Chakravarti, actually, which I really um, recommend, although there's been other, other analyses in the past. Um, what is interesting about this um, text is that it shows what accommodation was about for, for, for these Jesuits. They were learning local languages. That's the fundamental point. They were engaged, local, locally engaged with the communities. Uh, they were engaged with different castes. They were developing different strategies for the Brahmins and for other castes, uh, for, for more working class castes, basically. But the fundamentally accommodation was not about cultural dialogue like that, as simple as that. It, it was very much a paternalistic, a paternalistic uh, enterprise. It was saying, we are teaching through religion, we are destroying their temples. In essence, we are putting pressure on them to convert but then we're giving them the tools to feel pride, uh, proud about their new identity. 
And it is a successful enterprise to the extent that a number of, a number of converts to Christianity did accept the Christian Purana as their own sacred literature. It was, it was successful to the extent. So we, um, we must not forget that accommodation is, is not cultural dialogue for the sake of cultural dialogue. It is selective the acceptance of some customs and some social conventions and literary traditions in order to essentially fulfill a unidirectional process of cultural transformation where obviously there is in the Christian tradition there is one true religion only, and that's the only one that matters. Um, and that's the, the, the point of view. So the, the cases of Thomas Stephens, I think it, it is a good example of um, how you can have an outsider become an insider up to a point. Up to a point. And his relationship with his converts is hierarchical. They help him write the Christian Purana, no doubt about it. He learns Marathi with them. But ultimately, he is the Jesuit, He's the teacher. He's the teacher of the highest truth. So basically, they're different. You learn other things. I mean, the whole thing of accommodation is you can accept food. You can accept dress. You can do like Roberto Nobili, dress like a sanayasi and become a vegetarian in order to be accepted by the Brahmins. You, you speak Malayalam, uh, you speak Tamil in this case, and uh, uh, perhaps um, a bit of Telugu as well, but you do not, you do not, um, you do not, do that because you want to become one of them. You do that because you want them to become one of you. And this is the justification of accommodation. And of course, it's a controversial move. And the interesting thing about Nobili is that he was considered to have gone native by the other Portuguese Jesuits and criticized to the point that he was um, uh, um, almost persecuted by fellow Jesuits in Goa. And he had to pull some strings and support at higher levels in Rome in order to get his methods approved. Uh, he came from a good aristocratic background. It always helps. Um, but there was a soldier in particular, a Portuguese soldier who had become a Jesuit, Gonzalo Fernandes Trancoso, who essentially was accusing him of having compromised with idolatry and become one of the others. He's, he's no longer, because he was, of course, trying to distance himself from the Portuguese. So that was an insult to the Portuguese in Goa. So if you become too, I mean, I mean, becoming too much of an insider means makes you an outsider from your own local colonial background. That is a very, he's in the borderline, Robert Tenovili. Thomas Stevens is also an interesting case because he was an outsider also in England, but he comes from, he was a Catholic. He had to leave England in order to remain a Catholic. And then he was an outsider in, the, in Portugal because he was an Englishman, not a Portuguese, and he was one of those Jesuits who was presented and had to struggle to find recognition in, 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 in the Portuguese empire because they were not seen as Portuguese. And within the Jesuit order, which was a very cosmopolitan order, there were also tensions between the nationalities, in particular the Portuguese presented the Italians, who were very domineering in the Jesuit mission in those years, um, and, and people like Thomas Stephens are caught in the middle. Basically, he's an outsider everywhere. He's an outsider in England. He's a kind of outsider in the Portuguese uh, world. Uh, of the state of the India, he's an outsider in, in Salcete. He's everywhere an outsider. And it is as a permanent outsider that he becomes um, the author of the Christian Purana. Um, now, I think that this helps illustrate one kind of setting, which is what I would describe the settler colonialism. So we had, had first the traveler, um, the traveler who comes from just for some year in, 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 a, in a Muslim community, then we have had the, the, the settler colonial kind of uh, context. Now I would like to move to a third context, which is the, the context of the Mughal, the Mughal court. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot to say something. I, did, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I don't want to forget that as well. Um, I, um, I was talking about the internal divisions um, within the Portuguese system and how someone like Thomas Stevens or Robert Tonovili could eventually be seen as outsiders also by their own community. What is interesting is that the Portuguese in Goa were increasingly seen as exotic by other European travelers. So when people like Pietro de la Valle or Francesco Carletti or Jan Huygen van Schotten, who was a Dutchman who lived in Goa, 
um, he was at the service of the Archbishop of Goa, but then abandoned the Portuguese system, went back to Europe, went to Holland, declared himself a Protestant, that's time of the rebellion of the Dutch Republic, and then published a book about India, which was in effect a case of massive espionage. His book published in the 1590s is, 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 a, is basically all the information about the Portuguese Empire in India made available to the enemies of the Portuguese, the Dutch uh, rivals, then beginning their, their, their rival East India Company. In that book, he presents the Portuguese essentially as some in Goa, some not exactly the same as Europeans. And the same can be said to say for a lot of travelers who are Catholic, like, like Francesco Carletti or Pedro de Valle. So what we find here is that as, as, as the colonial society is very hybrid, it becomes more local, it becomes Indo-Portuguese rather than Portuguese, it becomes seen as exotic by other Europeans who come just from Europe. So the cultural distances keep shifting. There's no fixed Europe, India. I think that that is the message I'm trying to give very clearly here. There's always um, a movement and fluidity. And within that fluidity, then, then the, the more you become the other, the, the more you distance yourself from your old self. So in effect, you, the more you become into Portuguese, the, the more you're seen, although you don't want to be perceived, of course, the Portuguese in Goa are very proud of being Portuguese. But when the Europeans go there, they perceive them as a bit funny and for some strange customs. And they describe them as exotic. And there is a rhetoric of exotization, which is not about Hindus or Muslims, which they exist, of course, as well, but it's about the Indo-Portuguese. So at that point, I did want to move on now to the Mughal court, because it provides another kind of setting for encounters, uh, which is the one that will occupy the rest of my talk. Uh, it is, of course, perhaps the, the better known one. There is, in some ways, we're talking about cosmopolitanism here again. We, we described mercantile cosmopolitanism earlier, earlier in places like Calicut. Now I'm talking about uh, Kurdic cosmopolitanism, which is a subject that has attracted attention also in the last few years. In, in, a, in a Kurdic cosmopolitan context, you find um, the dynasties of the Mughals, and also there, there are also courts like Bijapur and, and, and elsewhere that are also following similar cu cultural patterns, whose cultural background is wider than India. They obviously have Iranian, Persian, cultural models very strongly. Uh, they also have ethnically people of Central Asian, Afghan origin, Abyssinian as well. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of circulation of elites, military elites. There's a circulation of scholars and Sufi saints. There is a whole cosmopolitan world. It is in some ways still part of that Muslim Okumene that in Batuta was also a very troubling in the 13th century. Uh, although in this case, it's it's been fragmented in three big blocks, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Mughal Empire. They do exchange embassies. They participate in a similar cultural horizon. They are rivals as well, but they also share many cultural patterns. And in, in the case of the Mughals, clearly a great deal comes from Iran, from, from the Safavid uh, court. Um, and be, I mean, of course, that they are Timuris themselves. They, they, their, their background is Timuris. And the Timuris themselves were Turkey, Turkish conquerors of Iran. So they were not Persian speakers. They were Turkish speakers who adopted Persian as a cultural, literary, administrative language and then go to India. So you can see this very complex, multi-layered cosmopolitanism. And they're in India too. So the whole project of Akbar and his successors is, in, in effect, to, to keep a balance between these cosmopolitan Muslim Mokumene and the local realities of India. It is a balance where they, be, they also become patrons of, of, of Sanskrit, as Akbar in particular, as you know. I'm just saying things you'll know, but I think in the context and we're talking, it's worth remembering them. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's cosmopolitanism, which again is engaged locally in a hierarchical position, although in this case it's not just religion, it's about empire. 
Um, and in that context, we find many Europeans engaging in, in encounters which are dialog dialogical, dialogical to some extent. We have, for example, uh, the Jesuits being welcomed by Akbar in his court, people like Antoni Montserrat and Rudolf Aquaviva in the first embassy, or Jerome Xavier in the second embassy to, to Jahangir's court. These are people, like, for example, Jerome Xavier, who will write, like Thomas Stephens was writing in, in Marathi, he will write in Farsi, in Persian, a uh, book about the life of Christ, Fuente de Vida. It's the same project, but in a different, in a different setting. He will also write a book about political advice in order to show Jahangir that he is not only there to learn to teach Christianity, but also that there is a possibility of communication in political philosophy between the world of Europe and the world of, and the, world of, uh, uh, of, of the Mughals. And, and therefore, he combines Persian sources that he has access to in the Mughal court with European sources of political wisdom, then you say it's all the same, basically. Single God, who should be a Christian in his own perspective, a single, a single, a single, a single, um, a, a single political philosophy. It's a universalistic project. Um, then we have, of course, uh, ambassadors like uh, the English Sir Thomas Rowe, trying to promote a mission, uh, sorry, a commercial, a commercial, uh, a commercial Enterprise, the English East India Company. And then we, we have philosophical travelers like Francois Bernier, um, who is there in a very interesting capacity as essentially someone who is planning to write a book about India. And so he's, he, he represents a new breed of traveler, the traveler who is no longer writing for practical purposes, either religious, ambassadorial, or commercial but he's actually writing already for a public just for the sake of writing about another culture. And this is become established in the 17th century in Europe as one of the key genres of travel writing is what we call the philosophical traveler. And in this case, Bernier has spent many years and he has a partner there who was his patron, who was a, the governor of Delhi, actually, Danish man Khan. So what we find here is many different kinds of dialogues. These are dialogues with limitations again. I mean, that is to say they, they are, I mean, they're not trying to become the other. They're just simply trying to, to adapt to some extent. And, I mean, uh, the, the Jesuits obviously will be disappointed in their hopes that Akbar becomes Christian, uh, which was um, uh, quite far-fetched all along. Uh, but they will try, because it's their obligation. Interestingly, we have the perspective of the Mughals. In the case of Jahangir, there's been a lot of emphasis recently on um, Abdal Sattar bin Qasim Lahori, who, 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 who wrote his own um, record of the conversations that took place in the evening organized by Jahangir. And what's interesting is that there, the, the, the role of Jerome Xavier is like of, the view of a buffoon. I mean, someone who's trying to convince them to be Christian uh, with ridiculous arguments, and they make fun of him, basically. Um, whilst in his own self-presentation, he is some kind of missionary hero. So here we see how these two perspectives. Um, there, there is, I think, a shared, a shared understanding, a court, court setting, makes it possible to build on analogies. I, I mentioned earlier how Barbosa built on aristocratic analogies, uh, how Roberto Novelli, also following Ines Zupanov here, also builds his mission to the Brahmins on an aristocratic analogy. The Italian elite can talk to the Brahmin elite and, and agree about social values, even if we're trying to change religion. And then here we have, in a court setting, everybody shares um, courtesy, gifts, uh, exoticism is part of what makes it possible to be a Frank, a European, in the Mughal court successfully. And, and you have to be, bring, you be, I mean, this is a, a classic, a well-known image of, of, of Thomas Rowe as part of the, uh, the Jahangir's uh, court culture inscribed in a painting where the object matters. And, and that object mattered to Jahangir is clearly work his own memoirs. I mean, it's just a quotation from, 
from Jahangir's memoirs, where he, he, he expresses how he actually values very much the Europeans, the Franks, for the gifts, the objects they carry. So he had ordered Mukarrab Khan to go to the port of Goa uh, on several businesses to see the Viceroy and to, and, to, and to purchase any rarities he could get hold of there for the real treasure without any consideration of cost. He paid any price the Franks asked for whatever rarities he could locate. When he returned from there to the court, he presented the rarities he had brought for my inspection several times. He had every sort of thing and object. He had brought several very strange animals I had not seen before. Objects, animals from Africa, from different parts of the world. Uh, essentially, this is a situation where we have coexistence, tolerance in a courtly setting, but without any attempt to break the barriers between sides and outsiders. Here you are cultivating exoticism. Cultivating exoticism. That is, I would say, what defines this position. Fine. And I am going towards the end, and I'm going to now... Is, is, is it working? That yeah, good. Okay. Excellent. So I'm going to go towards the end now. Oh, I didn't realize it's 11. Okay. And I will talk about... Um, uh, uh, Bernier, because I think that his book, the, his travels to India, represent the high point of, um, of, of engagement with, with the Mughal court and with India, um, and the North India, in the 17th century. There's other very good texts. I'm not trying to say it's the best at all. But in terms of its impact, it is the kind of book that really had a, a huge transformative effect on European culture. People read it, and, um, and, um, and a, a number of topics in particular in the European Enlightenment cannot be understood without Bernier's book. Um, the first one is his analysis of despotism. I mean, his analysis of the, of the Mughal system is essential to Montesquieu's theoretical development of the distinction between modern monarchies and despotisms. Um, so this is one of the things. But another interesting thing is that he is, um, writes about superstition and Hinduism as superstition. So the image of Hindu religion as a superstition, superstitious religion um, sh shifts from what used to be the rhetoric of the missionaries, which is based on our religion is right, theirs is wrong, into something quite different. In a philosophical analysis, the Hinduism problem is not that it's not Christianity. Hindu's problem is that it's superstitious. And this is an enlightenment discourse, a new discourse, a philosophical discourse. He himself, of course, is considered a libertine, a skeptical philosopher, influenced by Gassendi and Epicurus in his own society, his own term. So what we're seeing here is a change of approach, a change of gaze, which reflects the change of, in Europe taking place. Europe is turning against its own religious traditions to some extent. And that's why the way it looks at other religious traditions changes as well. Now, what I would like to end with really is, is his analysis of, of, of Hinduism and Sati in particular by first of all emphasizing that his views are not purely European. This is not just Europe versus versus. Um, India, there was, I mentioned a Mughal lord, Danish Men Khan, who was the governor of Delhi under Ergan Zeb, who was his patron. And Bernier exchanged many dialogues with him. He actually translated European philosophy for him. So he, this was a mutual exchange. He taught European philosophy to this lord whilst he learned about Hinduism and about Mughal traditions in the Mughal court. And he, in essence, shared with the Mughals his views about Hinduism. So he constructed his analysis of Hinduism not purely from a skeptical philosophical European tradition, but also in dialogue with a Muslim monotheistic tradition that was skeptical of the most extreme versions of Sufism. <coughs> and in that is an interesting point, which I think trying to say simply here is that even the most exoticizing discourses 
like those represented by Bernier, have an element of local engagement, but this is because there is a divide within the Mughal court between different uh, intellectual groups. Um, and, and so they basically, they used to have conversations with the Hindu pandit where then the Muslim and the Christian would agree to criticize the superstition of the pandit. And then Bernier would go back to Europe and would say, but this is also applicable to our own superstitious peasants. And I'll end up with, with a quote about Sati, which is, um, which is of course, the locus classicus of, exotization, of exoticism. And this is the image in, in, the, in, the, in the voyage with himself trying to intervene. And, that's, and, and I would like to say that, that what's interesting about Bernier is that he tries to intervene. He tries to stop these things from happening. And at Lahore, he says, I saw a most beautiful young woman burn who could not, I think, have been more than 12 years of age. The poor little creature appeared more dead than alive when she approached a dreadful pit. She trembled and wept with huge tears. But three or four of these tormentors, the Brahmans, assisted by an old woman who held her under the arm, seated her in the wood, tied her hands and feet lest she should run away, stoop the fire and burn her alive. I found it difficult to control my anger, but I had to limit myself to dislike this horrible religious practice. Well, this is the, the, the modern European perspective on Sati. I mean, it, this is not any different to what Ramon Roy will be writing in the early 19th century. And I think that there is an influence there as well going from Europe to India in this respect. Again, not com separate compartments, not completely different cultures, but co cultures that can have impacts on each other. What I would like to add simply is that Bernier, when he's trying to intervene, he appeals to the authority of the Mughals. He says, the Mughals agree with me, and it's only in order to avoid trouble that they don't persecute this more fiercely. But they agree that this is wrong. So uh, the conclusion really simply is, is, is to say that, uh, I, uh, that the outsider is there, the outsider is there, um, but, um, but that there is also, um, I would say, a continuous change both in India and in Europe. There's plurality both in India and in Europe, and there is a possibility of influence both from Europe to India and from India to Europe. Um, thank you very much, Professor Rubius, for uh, your highly insightful uh, uh, lecture on this uh, uh, rather difficult subject. And uh, he has uh, brought to us the complexities and nuances of uh, the travelers' lives, their backgrounds, uh, you know, the duration of their stay in India, the, the different areas of India in which they stayed, and. Uh, you know, that is uh, the kind of uh, analysis we need if we want to use uh, the travelers' accounts for Indian historiography. So I'm uh, very, very delighted at this lecture, and uh, I thank him once again uh, for coming here, participating, and delivering his lecture, and I thank uh, all other members of the audience. Now tea is waiting outside for us. We'll continue the discussion over tea. Okay, one or two questions we can have. The session was supposed to end at quarter past 11, but we can have one or two questions. Yeah. No, that's wrong, actually, this way. Does anyone have a question? Two questions, not more than that. In very, no. very brief. Now people are embarrassed. <laughs> no, that's okay. You can go ahead. We can ask two questions. Who had a question? Just one question. Yes. But Thank when you. was uh, it means Constantinople was closed in 
the entry border of the in the by feet road after the discovery started from uh, four sigizer in the uh, traveling discovery was started to new uh, area Be before they were uh, started to constant in constant temple is gate the time is uh, not a discovery too much is not going to traveling in the by sea and by all the way of the uh, section of the world not only in india this is right or wrong my point is this if it rise you can some explanation only few words about oh, why should they started stopped uh, uh, constitutional constitutional trade routes after then their traveling was started to round circles globe yes, you are asking about about the travel routes used by the portuguese ah especially they when they start stopped constitutional route then will started to discovery of the another ways means traveling up the sea routes Well, if I understand well, um, I mean, yes, uh, uh, essentially the, Portu the Portuguese reach, reach India by sea. That's right, and that m makes it possible to have much more regular interactions. So that changes entirely the nature of the relationship between India and Europe, in the sense that from the, tr the voyages of Vasco da Gama onwards, it is possible to have permanent Portu uh, European presence in in Europe, and even though it's very small. from the point of view of the number of people and territory occupied is very important in terms of psychological impact because india becomes a permanent part of european intellectual landscape um, uh, as a, as a place of continuous encounters throughout the 16th 17th centuries and then of course the dutch the english the french come later yes. uh, any other question okay uh, there is a small uh, Uh, you know question of myself maybe now that uh, we have uh, you know some time for questions um, you rightly compare um, the uh, account of ibn batuta with uh, that of barbosa and others uh, in saying that uh, uh, the account of ibn batuta is not so detailed it's not so perceptive am i right yeah he, it's he, more sketchy he's, sort he's of he's very pa patchy because he's really interested in taking on his own story i mean he's just a like connecting anecdotes he's just writing from memory that's important. i understand so uh, you know I mean, there are various reasons behind uh, this particular characteristic uh, about uh, the account of uh, ibn batuta uh, but uh, does it also some have something to do with the fact that ibn batuta because he is a muslim traveler arab traveler who is traveling at this time inside what he considers the islamic world so india is seen by him as part of uh, the umma part of the islamic world and much of what he sees here is not really so uh, exotic for him it's not so different from him for him that he would uh, notice it and write it down does it have anything to do with it so that's a very interesting question because in reality he is looking for exoticism anecdotes things he can tell but he's not interested in other cultural systems so he looks for a, a interesting story in order to explain how it is very safe to travel in the roads or how he gets robbed somewhere or how he so, so he look there is a the, the genre of adap in, in in the arabic world which which is a cordial genre where marvelous extraordinary <laughs> events anecdotes with a moral tale surprising all this is very much value so he's he's valuing all those things but as as you rightly say when it comes to 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 his sense of what he's up to intellectually he's about being a muslim everywhere and finding muslims everywhere there is a little touch of personality that i would like to bring in to do full justice to him batuta he objects again and again to how um easily and barbarically the Uh, the, some of the Muslim conquerors treat the, the, the Hindus and how they kill them. He says, "I don't want you to kill that person. I don't want to kill that man." And 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 then he um, he he says, "I have I, I have never seen people kill like this. So please don't do it." And he tries to use his court position in order to stop a number of things happening. So here there is a distance as well within Islam between the standards that come from the Western side of Islam that he comes from. and the standards he sees there in a frontier of course and in particular he is very very disturbed by what he sees in southern india very disturbed so yes but not becoming the other a form of cosmopolitanism
infrastructure and Fulton is a wreck. Yeah. You know, I would like to know, but even while adapting, because of local constraints or circumstances, they would still try to sort of maintain a hierarchy between a different um, cultures, Why, even while adapting. Is that that's possible? Right. Or that's right. That's, I think that adaptation is always partial selective, and it doesn't deny the possibility of hierarchy. The superiority of the Europeans? Uh, would well, the superiority of the Europeans um, <laughs> is relative, you see, because in some cases it will be about religion, sometimes it's going to be about philosophy or science or guns, or um, it's, it's always relative. I mean, they will also sometimes admire things about <laughs> India and say this is better than in Europe, or here they do things like this which, because it makes a lot of sense. I mean, when Pietro Lavalle says, I didn't understand for a while why they used cow dung to, to cover the walls of rooms, and now I see how it works because it's, um, these kinds of houses, it has a, a positive effect. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for memory now, I don't remember the, the exact explanation he gives, but it's an example of saying something I didn't understand, now I understand. So at the level of practical things, there is often a lot of admiration or acceptance of many things. Um, but when it comes to the fundamental belief systems or the fundamental assessments um, of cultural development, then we tend to vote <coughs> for hierarchical assessments. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Obvious. Uh, now tea is waiting outside. Thank, Thank you. you.